All right, so it uh, looks like we're pretty much ready. Um, my name is Shichia Li, I teach at the School of Architecture. For those of you who are in the School of Architecture, you don't need um, a welcome, but I just want to stand up and to welcome those who are not from the School of Architecture and telling you that we're really excited and we, although we do a lot of building, but we also do a lot of thinking as well. And this is really why we have an event like this tonight. And we're very excited to join hands with uh, Department of English in uh, co-hosting uh, this exciting event, and um, I um, um, we are uh, we're quite um, uh, uh, interested in in um, a lot of the issues that um, that are transforming our disciplines, and I think uh, uh, in in many ways uh, to sit within your neatly defined interdisciplinary uh, boundaries is actually um, uh, not very helpful and it's uh, sometimes uh, we really need to know how to get over those boundaries and hopefully tonight will be a very good demonstration of that and uh, I'm just without further ado I want to hand the podium over to uh, uh, Rita Falski, and who's a keynote professor of English in the Department of English, who will introduce our speaker tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I confess my motive for inviting Graham Harmon to Virginia was purely selfish. I was eager to meet someone whose writing had given me so much pleasure. These are one of those very rare moments, though, when selfishness coincides with social benefit, naked self-interest with a public good. The response to the news that Graham would be speaking has been widespread and intense enthusiasm radiating from all corners of the university as befits his interdisciplinary reach. Graham Harmon taught until recently at the American University in Cairo and is now a distinguished professor of philosophy at the Southern California School of Architecture. He's the founder of Object Oriented Ontology, a key interlocutor in the School of Speculative Realism, and the most astute explicator of Bruno Latour. It was in this last context that I first encountered Graham's work. Intrigued yet perplexed by Latour's ideas, I stumbled on Graham's book, Prince of Networks, Bruno Latour, and Metaphysics. After only a few pages, I knew myself to be in the hands of not only a major thinker, but a master stylist. The book's striking metaphors, vivid examples, comical counterfactuals, and literary verve did not only enlighten me, they enlivened me. As Graham writes in his recent book, Immaterialism, good writing is not just clear or devoid of fuzziness, it must also be vivid writing that brings its subject to life. Graham's writing animates not only his topic, but also his readers. Graham continues to write on Bruno Latour, most recently in an excellent book on Latour's political philosophy, as well as in an essay on, in the recent uh, New Literary History issue on recomposing the humanities. At the same time, he's also written numerous books in the area of object-oriented ontology, from his early book on Heidegger, to all being Heidegger and the metaphysics of objects, all the way through to weird realism, Lovecraft and philosophy, to his most recent book on Dante, which we'll be discussing tomorrow. The intellectual range of this scholarship is remarkable. Equally notable is its very wide reach and impact. In this respect, at least, Graham reminds me of our former colleague, Richard Rorty, while their concerns are very different, both are brilliant thinkers and stylists who can convey to large audiences why philosophy matters. To graduate students, I'd especially recommend his two volumes of essays, Towards Speculative Realism and Bells and Whistles, More Speculative Realism, not just for their incisive clarity and zing, but because of how the essays are introduced and contextualized. Graham pulls back the curtain to talk frankly about the ups and downs of his own academic career. It's very illuminating, I think, to hear him discuss professional obstacles and conflicts that are so rarely mentioned. 
the topic of his lecture today is on knowledge in the arts and taste in the sciences i'm thrilled to have him here please welcome graham harman um thank you rita uh first i want to make sure you can hear me it sounds like the microphone is working in the house all right a couple of things about my lectures that usually don't change one of them is i don't use powerpoint even though i have nothing against powerpoint i think it's a powerful tool but i wouldn't personally know what to show other than pictures of dead philosophers which won't be that interesting and i also like to pressure myself to stay interesting so if i have no visual props this forces me to stay as interesting as i can the other thing is that in my lectures i don't assume any prior knowledge of object oriented ontology so i usually start from zero and try to build my way up in 15 or 20 minutes to the point where everybody in the audience has some familiarity with what I'm talking about. And for those who already may know my books, uh, Aristotle once said it's more pleasurable to a new truth already known than to learn new truths. So you will have the chance to review some truths already known. I thought I would start, since I have a basically aesthetic theme for half of this lecture, I thought I would start with probably my most read essay on aesthetics, and that's the third table, which I wrote for the Documenta Art Festival in Kassel, Germany, five years ago. And uh, the third table, that metaphor is a reference to the formerly very famous metaphor of the two tables that used to be talked about a lot in philosophy. And the source of that metaphor is actually a physicist, not a philosopher. That's uh, Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington. And Eddington, you may know if you've taken basic physics course, is the one who performed the experiments measuring uh, the events during a solar eclipse that verified Einstein's general theory of relativity. One of the implications of Einstein's theory of gravity, of course, is that the uh, starlight passing near the sun should appear to be bent since the gravity of the sun should be curving space, effectively. And uh, Eddington carried this out and he found, after doing the measurements, that this was, this was happening. The starlight was apparent to be bent uh, during the eclipse. And this was the moment when Einstein first became a household name around the world. He was well known to philosophers before then. Is there too much feedback? Yeah, I'm just going to turn it down a bit. Okay. I think you're on mic two. I don't know. I'll turn it all down. Okay. Get a nice strong voice. All right. How's that? I think that's yeah. better. Okay. Thank Good. you. That was the moment when Einstein became a household name, when uh, even the Times of London announced Newton overturned new theory of physics. Uh, this was the moment, 1919, I believe it was, when Einstein became world famous even outside the scientific community. But Eddington used to be famous for something else as well that you sometimes hear references to. And that is his famous metaphor of the two tables. And that comes from his Gifford lectures, these pres this prestigious lecture series to which he was invited in Edinburgh. And he began uh, the lectures by saying, I'm sitting down to write my lectures at a table, but it's actually two tables. One table is the table of physics, which is mostly empty space, and it consists of all these tiny particles buzzing around. The other table, though, is the table that seems to be solid, that has a price, that has a relation to all the other objects in the room, that has a color. And uh, he says, that table also is real. It can't be eliminated either. But as a physicist, of course, he prefers the first one, the scientific one. Now, uh, it seems to me that neither of those is the real table. That's why I coined the phrase the third table. I want to argue tonight that both the arts, and that includes architecture, and philosophy are already dealing with the third table. The first and the second table, I will say, are the two kinds of knowledge about the table. But the philosophy and the arts, in the broadest sense, deal with a kind of cognition that is not a form of knowledge. And I'll start by asking you this. If somebody asks you what something is, what are the basic kinds of answers you can give to what something is? I hold that there are only two kinds of answers. You can talk about what it's made of. You can talk about what it does. Those are the two kinds of things we call knowledge. What's it made of? What does it do? And I'm going to say that the arts and philosophy don't give you a knowledge. They don't give you either of those two kinds of answers, what it's made of, what it does. They're going for a third table that's in between that can be dealt with elusively, obliquely, elliptically. And that's really the, the central point of object-oriented ontology. Well, one of the two. The other one being that everything can be considered an object as long as it's not reducible either to its parts or to its effects. The object is that which is neither of those but somewhere in between. And for the exact opposite of that, you can look at Tristan Garcia, a young French philosopher of objects whose work I greatly admire. He's written a book called Form and Object, a giant systematic work of philosophy that you can get in English from Edinburgh University Press. And Garcia says the table is the difference between its parts and its effects. Whereas I say that makes it oversensitive in both directions. You're just doubling the problem. Uh, but that's the alternative way of looking at it, is Garcia's way. 
Right, so uh, the third table, um, my argument is that if you try to reduce the table or any other object to what it's made of, you're not going to be able to explain emergent qualities. And if we look at the very beginning of Western philosophy and science, namely in the pre-Socratic thinkers, these were ethnic Greeks who lived, however, mostly on the western coast of what is now Turkey or in Sicily and Lower Italy. All of the pre-Socratic thinkers gave answers, well, there are two kinds of answers they gave. One of them is talking about some ultimate physical element that everything is made of. This is why they're the first scientists. So Thales of Miletus, the first of them, said everything's made of water. Water is the first principle of everything. So this isn't real, this isn't real. It's all just basic configurations of water in different permutations. You can reduce reality to water. Uh, Anaximenes, who came after him, said the same thing, but it was air. That by compressing air very tightly, you can get wood and bone and blood and iron. By rarefying air, you can get fire. So air explains everything. And his, his argument for air is that it's more transparent than water, has less flavor, has fewer qualities than water, so it's best suited to be the basis of everything. <laughs> then you've got Empedocles, who put together the famous so-called four Greek elements, air, earth, fire, and water, which he thought were joined by love and separated by hate. And, and then later you have Democritus, the theorist of atoms, the one pre-Socratic philosopher that's still taken somewhat seriously today as a literal option, atoms being particles of various sizes swerving through the void and creating out the larger things we see. All of these philosophers are saying, uh, find the most basic physical thing of which everything is made. There's another kind of pre-Socratic that didn't try to find some ultimate element because they thought all those elements are too specific. You need something more amorphous, harder to describe, and that's what they call the aperon, which we never translate into, into English. We leave it in the Greek. Aperon means like the boundless or the limitless. Think of it as a giant blob that has indeterminate qualities and that can turn into anything. So both of them are trying to find something deeper than what we see, and this you can call the undermining of objects. Objects are undermined by showing that they're too shallow to be the truth. All these mid-sized things we see are actually uh, permutations of some more basic underlying layer of which everything else is built. What's the problem with these underlying theories? The problem is they cannot explain emergence, larger things that are not necessarily dependent on their parts. So if you think of the University of Virginia, which has been here since Jefferson's time, none of the pieces, except maybe some of the atoms and the bricks, are still here, right? Uh, none of the students are still here from the 1800s. None of the faculty are still here. Uh, the, the campus has changed physically a great deal. And yet it's not nonsense to talk about the University of Virginia as in some sense the same entity. Even if you were to move the campus, as we did in Cairo, we moved it in 2008 from downtown Cairo, Tahrir Square, up 20 miles east of the desert. It's still the same university in some sense. And would have been even if all the faculty had been fired at that time and all the students expelled, and replaced by entirely new ones. It doesn't, it's not nonsense to say that it's the same entity in some sense. And so there's a sense in which objects are not entirely dependent on their, their pieces. If all the pieces disappeared, yes, the object would disappear. But within a certain range of limits, an object is robust to changes in its pieces, which we call emergence in a technical sense in philosophy. So that's what undermining cannot handle. OK, now that is still a kind of thinking. Undermining is a kind of thinking you can tend to often find in the physical sciences today. It's not so popular in, in philosophy anymore that you find it from time to time. The big danger in philosophy is the other kind of reduction, the upwards reduction, that people don't talk about as much. That's the notion that objects are not too shallow, they're too deep. Who needs this idea of objects? Everything is language, or everything is power, or everything is relations between each other, or everything's an event. There's nothing hiding behind that surface. This is a myth, a superstition. Uh, what we see is what we get, so that's enough. This is the more common tendency in, in modern philosophy, uh, with varying levels of intensity, which I call overmining, a term I had to coin. You can't do that in other languages as well, undermining, overmining. And my French translator had a heck of a time with this. He had to coin some construction metaphors instead, because French doesn't do it that way. Uh, Spanish also had to coin, had to use the construction metaphors. What's the problem with overmining? Well, the, the problem with overmining is that I hold that it cannot explain change. And here I want to talk about Bruno Latour, my favorite living thinker, with whom I nonetheless have many disagreements. Bruno Latour, one of the founders of what is called actor network theory in the social sciences, claims that an object is nothing more than what it does. And that's why he calls them actors instead of objects. The thing is what it does. He says, a thing is nothing more than whenever it transforms, modifies, perturbs, or creates. You are your actions. Now, the problem with this, as I see it, is a pretty simple one, which is that if I am nothing more than my actions, how is it that I'm capable of performing different actions 10 minutes from now, an hour from now, a day from now, a year from now? 
I hold this is because I am not fully expressed in my actions. There's a surplus. There is something called me. There is something that is not now or ever entirely expressed in the things I do. There are also counterfactual possibilities. Instead of being here, I could have turned down this invitation, which I never would have. Thank you, Rita. <laughs> but I could have. I could be sitting at home with my wife in Iowa right now, or I could still be teaching uh, regularly at the American University in Cairo, where I'm actually on leave right now. But I could be doing that right now instead. I could be, or I could be asleep in Egypt right now. It's probably sleeping time now. Uh, so there are all these counterfactual possibilities. I didn't have to be here doing what I'm doing, no matter how faded it might have seemed, seemed in some respect. Um, so there needs to be something held in reserve, some kind of surplus. And interestingly, this is a classical argument. This, Aristotle already saw this problem. Aristotle had some rivals called the Megarians because they were from Megara, near Athens. And they were very prominent at this time, more so than now. And the Megarians said, someone is only a house builder if they're building a house right now. A thing is only its action, its, its actuality. So you're only a house builder if you're building a house right now. To which Aristotle said, OK, but what about a master house builder who happens to be asleep right now? Does that person really have the same status as someone who knows nothing about house building or happens to be awake or someone who's trying and failing to build the house? Aristotle said no. And this is what led him to formulate his concept of potentiality in the metaphysics, a concept we all are familiar with. Thing has potential that becomes, can become actualized. But he said you cannot have a world where everything is simply what it actually is right now. I think this is a problem still at work in Latour's philosophy. And Latour even seems to realize this, uh, because maybe 10 to 12 years ago, 15 years ago maybe, he came up with this concept called the plasma. And it's kind of a funny passage in his book, Reassembling the Social, one of the two places he talks about this concept. He says, why did the Soviet Union collapse overnight with no warning? The plasma did it. Why do friendships and love affairs suddenly shatter when no one saw it coming? The plasma. Um, and the last one, my favorite. Why did a mediocre musician suddenly compose a brilliant symphony? Like if that ever happens. The plasma did it. And then this happened, I'm a Cubs fan, and so I was watching, <laughs> watching all these Cubs games very anxiously last, last October. And who was it? Somebody hit a three-run home run against the Dodgers in the bottom of the 10th. It was Miguel Montero. And my friend sitting next to me said, how does Mon Miguel Montero hit a three-run home run in the bottom of the 10th? The plasma. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so when the tour goes to the plasma, he, oh, he also gives a size estimate of it. He says all the networks, all the actors, which is supposed to be everything for the tour, is the size of the London Underground the plasma is the size of London as a whole. It's this gigantic, unformatted mass that explains all changes. This sounds a lot like the pre-Socratic operon that I just talked about a few minutes ago. It's this kind of amorphous, formless thing. But there's no, the Torah doesn't explain how we get from one to the other. How do we get from this shapeless mass to all the specific things that we see? There's no real explanation of that. And a lot of these philosophies get into in problems with that. The ones that think that reality is actually one, and then the human mind breaks it into pieces. They always fail to explain how the human mind, which shouldn't be different from the rest of the one anyway, somehow breaks away and then cracks everything into pieces. So this is why Triple O thinks there have to be objects already pre-existent, even though we don't know exactly what they are. OK, so the problem we said with undermining is that it cannot explain emergence. The problem with overmining that it cannot explain change. Usually these two come as a pair. They come together as what we call, what I call, dual mining. That's the first term I thought of, OK? Two things. Latin duo, dual mining. And I immediately Googled it because I hate coining neologisms. I wanted to see, I was hoping somebody had used this before, and they have. And it turns out that dual mining is a new term in the credit card industry to mean data mining you and text mining you simultaneously. <laughs> <laughs> so it has just the sinister connotation I wanted. And you'd be, you'd be shocked at what they can do. I was horrified to hear that credit card companies can predict three years in advance with 70% accuracy that you're going to get divorced. They can detect changes in your spending patterns. I don't know exactly what they are. But they've got a computer algorithm that can figure this out pretty accurately. So there's a lot of, lot of quasi-sinister violation of privacy stuff that you can do by predicting your future behavior, even before you know you're going to do it. So uh, dual mining theories try to get rid of the object in both directions at once. So an example would be, I already mentioned Tristan Garcia's philosophy first, right? Where the the uh, table is both its parts and its effects in difference from each other. So it covers both at once, but the table itself isn't really there. It's just the resultants of taking the two extremes. Um, Latour, when he starts off by saying everything is relational, but then he says there has to be this deep plasma that everything erupts from. 
and if you think of scientific materialism more generally, first of all, they're claiming to go all the way to the bottom, to undermine you get the most basic thing. But then they're saying it's completely knowable in mathematical terms. You can formalize it, which is something knowable, and therefore it's overmining. You can know the thing itself without residue, in principle. So all of these are dual mining objects that cannot get at the third term. So how do you get at the third term? I'm saying it's a third term that has nothing to do with knowledge. Knowledge always amounts, remember, to asking what a thing is made of or what it does. Undermining it, overmining it. Doing both is dual mining it. So we need a kind of cognition that is not a kind of knowledge. And this is where I start to get criticisms, because people say, if you can't say what a thing is, all you're doing is kind of gesticulating vaguely and making vague metaphors about things. Um, you are doing what they sometimes call negative theology, where you're just saying what God is not, not what he is. But the funny thing is, if you go look at negative theologians, in the Middle Ages especially, especially pseudo Dionysius, the greatest early negative theologian, you'll find that his or her, we're not sure who it was, his or her works are not entirely negative. For example, there's a passage on the Trinity, which is very beautiful where he says, uh, it's, it might be hard to understand that God is three and one at the same time, but imagine three lamps in a house. There's one light coming from these three lamps, and you can't tell which part of the light is coming from which lamp, yet there are three sources. Very beautiful, even if you don't believe in the Trinity. It, it adds something to our understanding of how the Trinity might be conceived. So it's not just negative. It's a kind of metaphorical theology. And once you start thinking about it, you'll see that a lot of human knowledge is not propositional and discursive. A lot of human knowledge is indirect, it's elusive, it's, um, it hints, and I can give you a few very simple examples. Um, one of them is jokes. You can ruin a joke by literalizing it. The joke needs that jump, and there are lots of examples I could give of, of jokes and show you how they work, but let's take a very simple one. Uh, there was a study, I don't know, five to ten years ago, where they had a whole list of jokes and they went to every country and uh, uh, asked them, rank which of these jokes are the funniest. And actually, all of them were bad. <laughs> but I thought the Belgians had the best taste. The Belgians, the, most of the jokes on the list were horrible, but the best one, not much of competition, was uh, there, are, there are three kinds of people, those who can count and those who can't. <laughs> it's not that funny. <laughs> but you can recognize it as a joke, right? <laughs> Now imagine you were with a child, and the child said, I don't get it, you know, what, what does it mean? And then you have to explain to them, well, see, they said there are three kinds of people, those who can count and those who can't, but they miscounted because they only gave two kinds, so therefore they must be inscribing themselves in the category of people who can't count. Okay, it never was that funny to begin with, but now it's really not funny. <laughs> Once you've explained the joke. Because by literalizing a thing, you're translating it into something that it's not. No literal translation of a thing gives you that thing itself any more than a flattened map can give you a globe. It's mathematically impossible to, project, to take a three-dimensional globe and flatten it. You're going to have to distort either the shape or the size of the countries. And the same is true when you literalize things. And this is literary criticism. This is very well known from the new critics who talked about how you cannot paraphrase a poem. It's, other critics have shown that you cannot paraphrase a metaphor. Right? You're always going to lose something. You can try to put a metaphor or a poem in a prose description, but you're never going to quite get it. So literalizing a thing is always problematic. And I can give you other examples. Threats usually are better when they're vague, right? <laughs> Literalize the threat, and it's, it's uh, no longer so frightening. So the, the most famous example would be um, Marlon Brando is an offer he can't refuse in The Godfather. Very nice threat, an offer he can't refuse. If he had said instead, if he doesn't give my friend the part in the movie, I'm going to cut off his horse's head and put him in his bed at night when he's sleeping. That's a grisly threat, but it's not as ominous somehow as the offer he can't refuse. And I remember before the, um, here's an example from real life, before the first Iraq war in 1991, there was some worry about chemical weapons being used on U.S. soldiers, and Dick Cheney used the nice godfather threats, whatever you think of Cheney. Um, he said, if chemical weapons are used on U.S. soldiers, the United States will respond immediately and forcefully in a manner from which it will take Iraq centuries to recover, which is a you know, horrifying threat, right? And not a nice thing to say, but you can see that it works much better than if he had spelled it out. If he had spelled it out, it wouldn't have been as scary, right? We're going to shoot 48 warheads. And, you know, this, this would not have worked as well as a threat. It's scarier when it's just stated like that. Um, okay, so, that, so much for threats. Uh, I often like to talk about the example of wine tasting, because Daniel Dennett, who's a rather reductive materialist philosopher, wrote a, an article 
called Quine and Quelia, in which he talked about wine tasting in a fascinating way that I also hate. Um, what he said is that, um, you know, imagine a wine critic samples a wine and says, flamboyant and velvety pinot, but lacking in stamina. <laughs> which is how wine critics talk and write. And then its attitude towards this is basically, what a bunch of pretentious garbage. You, know, you, could, just, you could pour the wine into a machine and it'll analyze the chemical formula. That's real wine tasting. And if you want, you could also get the machine to say flamboyant and velvety pinot lacking in stamina and print it out for the benefit of pretentious humans. But actually, the, the chemical formula is the real wine tasting. Um, the other part is just garbage. Well, I think we can all see that something is lost when that happens. I mean, yes, the chemical formula is true, but you're losing something when you undermine it like that, when you reduce it to the physical origins of the wine flavor. Okay, um, and in fact, I think a lot of the best writing today is done by critics in the sense of food critics, wine critics, theater critics, architecture critics, art critics, literary critics. Um, usually when we think of critique, we think of tearing things down and showing that they're all just made of X, right? So, you know, Marxist critique of, of um, Bleak House by Dickens might say, seems to be about uh, an orphan who's been raised by somebody else and a murder mystery, but in fact, it's really about oppressive class relations in Victorian <coughs> Okay, yeah, These things can give you some insight, but they're not going to quite do justice to the book. Right? That's the kind of critique we usually think of. You're critiquing from a standpoint of superiority. You're above the thing and tearing down. Under, it's an undermining criticism. You're trying to show the building blocks that really make the work of art or the food go. But there's the other kind of critique, which is where you are having to speak that kind of diagonally sideways about the thing, not in terms of discursive prose statements, but in a way that's somewhat poetic. And this is why, as I said, art critics, architecture critics, wine critics, food critics are often fantastic writers. The subject matter forces them to do this, forces them to be elusive with an A uh, rather than direct. So um, uh, this does run the risk of pretension. And I think one of the risks that we run in the arts and the humanities and, and architecture is the risk of pretension. And we should not let that scare us. We should try to avoid pretension, but we should not let it scare us. You're not usually going to find pretentious natural scientists or pretentious mathematicians, because these disciplines are about stating things. What you see is what you get. Here's what I'm saying. Uh, you cannot do that in these other disciplines, I say, because we're talking about things not in terms of the properties that belong to them, but about the object apart from its properties, the object which is hard to get at. So pretension is the professional risk that we run in our disciplines, and we should not be too ashamed. We, we should try to avoid it, but we should not be ashamed about that risk. All right, so I've talked about undermining and overmining. I haven't said too much about metaphor yet, but metaphor is one of the ways, obviously, that you can speak about a thing without speaking about it, which, uh, as I've said, some rationalist philosophers think you should just say what a thing is clearly in good plain English. No, I, I think good vivid English requires that you are not always as, you're trying not to be more clear than what you can see. Imagine if someone were to say, you know, Leonardo's a pretty good painter, but this, what's all this chiaroscuro, this shadow in the Mona Lisa, why doesn't he just paint her in clear direct sunlight? You know, we, we consider that to be a ridiculous critique, right? There's a time for shadow in painting. So why isn't there a time for shadow in language? There is. But sometimes the shadows are necessary to get us closer to what the thing really is. Sometimes premature clarity is a danger. Premature clarity doesn't get you as deep sometimes as hesitating and waiting and seeing where the words lead you. Okay, so what happens in metaphor? In metaphor, uh, which Max Black says in his brilliant essay on the topic, cannot be paraphrased in literal terms. What is happening? I, I'm very fond of an essay on metaphor by Jose Ortega y Gasset, a Spanish philosopher who used to be read more than he is. I think he was a little too associated with the existentialists, and when existentialism went out of fashion, Ortega went out of fashion. I think you still read him in art history. Uh, the humanization of art is maybe one famous thing of his that's, that's talked about. He talks about a, a Spanish poet, Lopez Pico, who gives the metaphor, the cypress is like the ghost of a dead flame, cypress tree. And he, he says there's actually three metaphors there, calling it a ghost, calling it dead, and calling it a flame. So he simplifies it and said the cypress is a flame. Well, what does that mean? Well, you can see there's a kind of general similarity of shape between them. So that makes it possible to compare the two objects. But it's not a literal assimilation of real qualities, because in literal terms, the cypress and the flame don't really have much in common at all, other than that shape. As he says, that the shape is kind of a pretext to allow you to, to fuse the two things together and create an identity out of it. Let me give you another point to explain what I'm getting at here. You cannot make a metaphor out of things that are too alike or too unalike. 
So if you were to say a pen is like a pencil, <laughs> yeah, it's not a metaphor. If you say Amsterdam is like Venice, okay, you know, it's they're both cities with a lot of water and canals and old histories. Uh, or if you say a dollar is like 89.3 euro cents, again, that's a literal equivalence or whatever it is today, whatever the exchange rate is. Or, but if you were also to go to the opposite extreme and say, to use Andre Verminsky's example, drinking a milkshake is like drawing an isosceles triangle. <laughs> and I think Verminsky defends this and says, yeah, you still want to know what the resemblance is. You do, but it, it isn't working as a metaphor. You're just confused. <laughs> now, different audiences might be capable of understanding different metaphors, but it either works for you or it doesn't. Just like a joke either works for you or it doesn't. And just like an artwork either works for you or it doesn't. So it has to be somewhere in between. There has to be enough similarity that the comparison can be made, but not too much similarity. Now, there's another aspect here that Ortega misses, which is that Ortega says the cypress is compared with the flame and the flame is compared with the cypress. This is not true, if you look at it. Metaphors are always asymmetrical. If you say a cypress is like a flame, or if you say a flame is like a cypress, those both might work, but they're different metaphors. Why? Because one, uh, one object is in the subject position, the other is in the predicate position. Let me give you another example. Homer's most famous metaphor, the wine dark sea. What if it had been the sea dark wine? In the second case, you're talking about wine. You're not talking about the sea. So in the first case, you have sea, and you're giving it the darkness of wine, and that also implies that the sea has other wine-like properties, like oblivion, drunkenness, these sorts of things. Now, if you were to flip it and say the sea dark wine, suddenly you have wine, and you're giving it sea qualities. You're giving it bottomlessness and adventure and being filled with monsters and these sorts of things. So you have one object in the subject position, the other in the predicate position. How can this happen? The reason this can happen is another of the central principles of triple O is that the object and its qualities are split at all times. There's not an identity between those. If you look at the history of empiricist philosophy, look, for example, at David Hume and his, his kindred thinkers, there's a tendency to think that the object is just a bundle of qualities. Right? That there's no such thing as apple. There's red and juicy and hard and cold and spherical and all these other things. And by seeing all those qualities come together over and over and over again many times, you start to form this nickname, Apple, that's just a nickname for all those things held together. This is the empiricist approach. As I see it, this was first challenged in phenomenology by Edmund Husserl in 1900, uh, 1901, with logical investigations, where Husserl says actually the, the whole thing comes first. And the argument for this is basically that you can turn the apple in your hand and you know, toss it up in the air and catch it and view it from different distances and in different moods and different lighting conditions. And you're not saying to yourself, okay, it's 93.8% similar to what it was five seconds ago. And therefore, I will say arbitrarily, there are enough family resemblances that we can call it the same apple in quotation marks. No, you say there's the apple and I'm seeing it from different sides. And how can you verify that? Well, just it looks like the same apple to me. We're talking about experience here, not about reality. And so I, I am, in fact, experiencing it as the same apple in all those cases. And so for phenomenology, the object as a whole tends to come before the qualities of the object. The qualities actually are enslaved to the object in a certain way, emanating from the object. Here's an example. Merleau Ponty, another great phenomenologist, says that the black of an ink pen and the black of an executioner's hood are not the same black, even if they're the exact same wavelength of light. You can see why. The black of the executioner's hood has all that ominousness connected to it with executions whereas the black of the ink is um, connected to the power of the, the beauty as the calligrapher writes with it. Uh, the qualities may be exactly the same in perceptual uh, physiological terms, but they are not the same because they are impregnated, as it were, with the, the object to which they belong. Just like uh, satellites or the planets don't escape the orbit, even if they look alike. All right, so triple O has a lot to do with uh, creating separations where other people try to collapse the differences. Another example is the fact that Triple O is a realist philosophy. Triple O thinks there is a, re a real object hidden behind its various manifestations, which lots of philosophies want to deny. And so there is a, a, a driving a wedge between the object and its quality. The real object is hidden. The sensual qualities, as I call them, are there before us. And then there's the other kind of object which phenomenology talks about, which is the object not hidden from us, but the object there, that's there, the object that's there, the apple that is there in all my experiences, even though it's already, or sorry, always attached to all these various qualities that are encrusted on it, that I can't get rid of. 
I can never see an apple, uh, w but not from a specific angle. I can never see the apple not in a specific mood or from a specific side. I'm always seeing a partial profile of the apple. Uh, but the apple itself is, divorced from all of those, is still there in the, in the experience at all times. So object-oriented ontology is about splits between objects and qualities. And since we have two kinds of objects, two kinds of qualities, according to Triple O, there are actually four tensions, as we call them. There's the real object and the sensual object, real qualities and the sensual qualities. But I won't get into the weeds on that. You can read my book, The Quadruple Object, if you want to see more about that. Uh, what's important here is that the, the aesthetic experience, according to Triple O, comes when a, a wedge is driven between the real object that withdraws. It's like constant on itself. You can never get at it. You can never translate it fully. And the qualities which are apparent. And in the case of metaphor, which Ortega takes to be the root of all aesthetic experience, and I have no reason to disagree with that at the moment, uh, the real object seems to vanish. Its qualities are there, but we're, there's a sense of mystery about what the object is that's holding these things together. And it's also a claim of Triple O that uh, since the real object seems to withdraw, to use Heidegger's term, the real object is missing, but the qualities are there. We don't know where the real object is. And since Triple O also holds that qualities cannot float free of an object, what is the object in the case of the experience of an artwork, for instance? And Triple O's claim is that that object is I myself. I am the only real object on the scene. I stand in for the cypress, and I bear the flame qualities. So any kind of aesthetic experience for Triple O is, is a theatrical experience, not in the sense of observing the theater, but in the sense of being the actor, performing it, the sense of the method actor. I am a rock. What's your motivation? Um, <laughs> This is the root of aesthetic experience, according to Triple O, and I would even hazard, the guess, hazard a guess that if we, could, if we could prove this somehow, which we can't, I would guess that the mask is the first form of artwork that ever existed. Masks do not survive because they're made of fragile material. So we have cave paintings and we have jewelry. We don't have any really early masks, but I would guess that was the first thing. Animal masks or something else, spirit mask, devil mask, was probably the first artwork, given the theatrical component of aesthetics. And in passing, this puts Triple O completely at odds with Michael Fried, still a very influential art critic, who opposes the literalism of, of minimalist art and the theatricality of it. He thinks those are the same. I say they're not the same. I say that literalism in art means what you see is what you get. There's nothing hidden in the artwork. There's no aesthetic depth, which I agree with him is a bad thing. You can't get art out of this. But then he also says that since the artwork is reduced to literalism and minimalist art, its only point can be to provoke a theatrical reaction out of you, which he says is bad. And I say, no, there's a theatrical component to every artwork. Because if you're not experiencing it, it's not an artwork. Um, Garcia, who I mentioned earlier, who thinks the table is the difference between its parts and its relations, Garcia also thinks that an artwork is an artwork even if no one's there. I don't think so. I think if there's a nuclear holocaust and all humans are gone, and whatever other animals are capable of aesthetic experience, the artwork is no longer an artwork. It's a physical thing that still lasts, but it's not an artwork anymore. So uh, I hold that the human is an essential ingredient of the artwork. An artwork should be deeper than its observer. It should have an aesthetic quality that is not reducible to anything we say about it. But the human is still necessarily an ingredient. And I'll give you an analogy to show how this works. Manuel Delanda, a philosopher I like very much, a kind of Deleuzian who's interested in science, self-taught philosopher who started as a filmmaker, never took a philosophy class in his life, as far as I know, just read all the philosophy on his own. Uh, he wrote a book called The New Philosophy of Society about 10 years ago. At the beginning of this book, he said, my goal in this book is to develop a realist theory of society, which means society as it is apart from humans. Now, you might think that's impossible, right? Because society is made of humans. How can you have a society apart from humans? And he, he says, that's an equivocation, right? Humans are a necessary ingredient of society, but that doesn't mean that society is just whatever we think it is. It's not. We can be wrong about society. Society has a reality that is something more than the sum of people in which it's made, and is something deeper than whatever sociologists say about it. Sociologists can be wrong. There's an object there they're trying to describe that is separate from their, their discipline. The discipline has to try to work harder to get at the object called society. All right. So what I've said so far, what are we doing in time? I'm trying to look at the time. Oh, it's 5.43. Good. We're, going, we're doing well. Um, so far, I've sounded probably as if I'm saying that the arts and philosophy uh, talk about things metaphorically, not in terms of knowledge, but in some indirect way. And the sciences talk about uh, things in terms of their properties, their qualities. 
and that does tend to be true, I think. however, i want to avoid a taxonomy here. i want to avoid saying this is what science does, this is what art does. because taxonomies often go badly in philosophy. and i'll tell you what i mean. what does modern philosophy tell us? modern philosophy tells us that there are two kinds of things people and everything else. think about what, a, what an unlikely classification scheme that is. here we are, this tiny species on this rather unimportant planet in a rather mediocre galaxy towards the end of it. there's us. And then there's everything else in the universe on the other side. This is what modern philosophy does. It tells us thought and world are the two different kinds of things. So the, admittedly, thought is an interesting phenomenon. It tells us a lot about who we are. Um, humans are interested in humans. Humans are interested in what differentiates us from the other things. But it does not follow from that that all of philosophy should be built around this basic distinction where thought is 50% of philosophy, when it's this rather tiny thing that exists in the universe compared to all the other entities that exist. we really want to put reptiles and black holes and neutron stars and, and avalanches and everything else over here, despite how different it is, and then humans here. very unlikely. Uh, as I see it, philosophy needs to start as what is called a flat ontology, which means you're starting by trying to talk about what everything has in common. and for triple O it's objects. everything's an object. and again, object doesn't mean durable, hard, solid, physical for us. it means anything that's not reducible either to its parts or its effects anything that's in the middle between those two. That's, a, that's an object. so um, we want to start by talking about what everything has in common. And yes, humans are very interesting, especially to us. but it does not follow that humans deserve 50% of philosophy. that's the argument. and so we do not want the taxonomy of human versus non-human, which by the way is simply the heir of the medieval taxonomy, where here you have the creator and here you have everything else. So it turns out to be just kind of a secularized theology, where instead of God being at the center of everything, humans at the center of everything, half of the universe. So that's worth avoiding. And I, I want to avoid the same thing here. I want to avoid the taxonomy of saying this is what art does, this is what science does. Um, there was a uh, small controversy within the speculative realism movement a few years ago, which is I was involved with. There's a scientistic wing of the speculative realists, represented by Brassier and his circle. And uh, I saw one of his followers put on the web, speculative realism is a philosophy based on the sciences rather than the humanities. and I wrote, no, that's not the point. speculative realism is about reality. there's reality in the humanities too, right? the reality in the humanities is that the objects of the humanities withdraw from any specific treatment of them by the humanities, including fictional ones. King Lear is not reducible to what people have said about King Lear, or necessarily even about the words that he speaks in Shakespeare's play. there's something more there. there's a real object even if a fictional one, that cannot be exhausted by all the things that are said about him or all the things that he says. and likewise, uh, science has its non-reality. Right? science has false statements, it has um, approximative statements that don't quite adequately refer to what the thing is, it has abandoned theories. so there's plenty of illusion on the science side too. so he was completely wrong to say that speculative realism is about science rather than the humanities. so we want to avoid those taxonomies. So uh, let me just talk briefly in the end here. That this is why the, my title is Knowledge in the Arts and Taste in the Sciences, right? because it looks as though I've set it up so there's no knowledge in the arts or philosophy, and, and that the sciences are all about ascribing true properties to things that exist and not about the object itself. But that's a slight oversimplification. So let's take a look at what we might do to look at things from the other side. Let's talk about taste in the sciences. How do we get taste in the sciences? Well, you, you can find some references in the literature. one of the best nonfiction books I ever read, I think it was rated the number two nonfiction book or top ten of the 20th century, was Richard Rhodes' The Making of the Atomic Bomb. and I strongly recommend that. Uh, this is my third atomic bomb reference tonight. I hope that does not portend anything. Uh, you never know these days. Uh, it's a fantastic book. It's, it's good as uh, political drama. It's good as some of the war stories are good. but what it really is is a great history of 20th century science. Because in order to get the reader up to speed, Rhodes has to take you all through quantum theory and how atomic fission was discovered and Fermi's experiments. Um, and one of the things it says in there, Oppenheimer, of course, is one of the key characters in that book, as he was in the creation of the bomb. And somebody said, what really distinguished Oppenheimer, who never got a Nobel Prize, he wasn't quite at the Nobel Prize level of science, most people thought, was they said his exquisite taste as a physicist. And you think, what does that mean? How can you have exquisite taste as a physicist? Taste is what Kant says about art, right? Kant distinguishes art from science in this way. He says that art is not about a kind of knowledge, it's taste. And taste should be universal, 
everyone of good taste should agree about this Mozart symphony being great or this other painting by somebody as being great. Uh, but taste is not something usually associated with the sciences, which even for Kant are supposed to produce discursive statements about the world that should be true. Uh, so what does it mean to say that Oppenheimer has taste? Well, the way it gets glossed in the book is that Oppenheimer had a sense of which problems were the important problems to work on. Interesting, right? That you might need taste to decide this isn't going to go anywhere, but this is. Um, it's not just a matter of, of whether your science turns out right or wrong. It's a matter of knowing which avenue has more potential. And then I also think of Watson's The Double Helix, one of the great controversial classics in the history of science, which I've read many times. Um, and what he says is that uh, a bunch of, well, I don't know what he's talking about. He's talking about whether DNA or protein is the source of heredity. And at the time they were working on the structure of the double helix, there were a number of scientists who still thought protein was the place to look. But Watson said, never mind, most of these were cantankerous old fools who unfailingly backed their own horses. That sounds like a very harsh thing to say about your scientific colleagues, but what, what would it mean to think that some scientists are cantankerous old fools who always back their own horses? There's an element of taste there as well. Someone doesn't have good intuition about which, which way is the way to go in science. So there, there are those statements to account for. And then I immediately think of Thomas Kuhn. And, and most of you are architecture students, I think. So I don't know how many of you read, have read Kuhn's Structure of Scientific Revolutions, controversial classic from the 1960s. Kuhn uh, distinguishes between, between what he calls normal science and what he calls paradigm shifts. He says that most scientists do what he calls puzzle solving, where they're trying to solve small puzzles that exist within an existing paradigm. So if you're working within Einsteinian relativity theory, gravity, there are always going to be some anomalies that haven't been solved yet by the scientists. And he thinks this is what puzzle solving normal science is, what the vast majority of scientists work on. But then there's a certain kind of science that he calls paradigm shifting. And this is often done, he said, either by young people or by people from other disciplines who aren't overly constrained by their professionalization yet, and who therefore can think outside the box and invent a totally different paradigm. Now, the usual uh, critique of this that Antikonians give, including my friend Delanda, is that this treats science as though it were a matter of religious conversion, and that suddenly Einstein's theory descended from the sky and everybody converted to it and threw out Newton's theory of gravity, which isn't exactly what happened. There's a story to be told about the speed at which people jumped onto Einstein's ship. And even the double helix, the same thing happened. It took a while for them to convince everybody that the DNA was a double helix. Um, or some people will dismiss it as merely sociological. That there are non-scientific reasons why suddenly everybody decides to go along with the periodic table in chemistry, that, you know, political pressures or something of this sort. Um, I've always read it differently. I've always read Kuhn's paradigm shifts as being about objects, right? because objects <coughs> For triple O are the things that are not reducible to their qualities, that are not reducible to puzzles about their nature, but are things that are separate from any of their qualities. And that when a new, new uh, uh, scientific object, such as Newtonian space and time, which are considered to be infinite and eternal, is replaced by Einsteinian space and time, which is supposed to be curved and relative, you essentially have a new object, even though both are called space and time. And so the paradigm shift, shifting in science is really about working on the object rather than working on the qualities. Um, now, Delanda, my friend, rejects Kuhn in his book, Philosophical Chemistry, because of what he calls the supposed holism of the, the uh, Kuhn's model. He thinks it's not a religious conversion. And he also says, science is not about progress, but it's about improvability. And it would take too long, I think, to get into the details of this. But he also sees. Uh, what makes something improvable, he says, is that it's quantitatively improvable rather than qualitatively improvable. But again, I think this simply affirms what Kuhn called normal science. That you can take a thing and continuously improve it. And um, it's, it's a way of viewing knowledge as continuous progress, kind of piecemeal progress on a well-defined object, whereas the great jumps forward in many fields have to do with completely changing the conception of what the object is, which Kuhn calls uh, paradigm shifts. And incidentally, I think this is the real difference between what we call analytic and continental philosophy. Um, I don't know if any philosophers showed up tonight, but, but um, it's often said that the difference between analytic and continental philosophy is, is merely sociological or it's passe. There's only one philosophy with a capital P. I don't think that's true. It's usually the dominant group that says things like that. The dominant group is the one that, that gets paid off by saying there's no difference between the different subgroups because they're in the Anglo-American world, analytic philosophy controls 
the whole thing. Um, with a few small exceptions, Catholic universities, some smaller state universities. And really what's, what analytic philosophy is about, it's about the idea of making, uh, turning philosophy into a science, right? Being very rigorous, writing short journal articles on very contemporary themes, the way scientists tend to do. Whereas analytic philo uh, continental philosophy uh, tends to view philosophy as progress in terms of great figures, great jumps, Kuhn's paradigm shifting. There's, there's a disadvantage for that too, which is that continental philosophers easily intimidate themselves by saying they're not on the same level as these great geniuses who shifted the paradigm completely. So it often leads to depression and uh, <laughs> nuts, and it leads to people thinking of themselves merely as commentators and historians on the works of these others, which is just what analytic philosophers charge us with sometimes. All right, now I want to say something also about jumps in evolution, because since I've made a lot of use of Lynn Margulis in my book in Materialism, uh, I, I wrote my first book on social theory, published about a year ago, called Immaterialism, Objects and Social Theory. And I chose as my object the Dutch East India Company. And the reason I chose that object is because Leibniz, one of my favorite philosophers, makes fun of the Dutch East India Company and says, that's not a real object. You know, it's just a bunch of people in ships. For Leibniz, an object is real if it's natural. He doesn't like thinking that two diamonds glued together can be a real thing, or a circle of men holding hands. Whereas for us, I think it's a lot easier to think that an airplane can be a real object, right? even if it's not natural. It has a certain unity to it, regardless of, of being fabricated in a, in a Boeing or somewhere. Um, so I chose the Dutch East India Company, and I realized I'd have to come to terms with actor network theory, with source theory, uh, because I've learned so much from it and yet disagree with it. And what's wrong with actor network theory in the social sciences? Well, I've already mentioned Latour's idea that everything's relational. A thing is nothing more than its relations. And one thing this does is it uh, fails to distinguish between important and unimportant relations. Right? So if you um, get up and move to another seat a couple rows down, that's not really an important change for you, right? It does change your relation to everybody else in the room, but it's not important. Even if you just rock back a little bit, you've changed your relation to everybody else in the room ever so slightly. But it's not really important. And actor network theory only gives us the criterion of which, which changes have lots of impact on other stuff. It's a relational criterion. Whereas I don't think so. I think that sometimes impactful events aren't as important as they look, whereas quieter events can be more important. So if you're looking at the history of the Dutch East India Company, in which a lot of battles were fought, you, you might be tempted to say the biggest battles were the most important things, but they're not. I tried to find maybe a half dozen or so things that were the most important, irreversible moments in the history of the company. And the model I used for that was Lynn Margulis, and I'll, I'll briefly discuss her work in case you don't know her. You should read at least Symbiotic Planets by Margulis from 1999. She unfortunately died uh, a few years ago unexpectedly of a stroke. Uh, her first husband was more famous, Carl Sagan, although her impact in the sciences has probably been a lot bigger. Uh, you know, the, the old story about Darwinian evolution is that it happens very gradually over time. Big fish eats little fish, and then big fish has bigger offspring, and then over time, through natural selection, stuff is evolving in ways that it fits certain ecological niches. Well, there's always been some opposition to that among evolutionary biologists, and Eldridge and Stephen Jay Gould are one example. They, they talk about punctuated equilibrium. The changes aren't gradual. They tend to be very sudden, and then things stabilize, and then things go slowly again. Um, they tend to relate that to large changes in the environment, which again is too relational for my taste. Uh, Margulis' theory is different. Margulis' theory is that life forms evolved through symbiosis where two previously separate life forms become one. And the example, first example she has in mind is that the human cell, which has all these organelles in it, all these different parts, uh, the, some of these organelles were not originally part of the cell. They were incorporated from, the, they came in as parasites actually, and started eating off the nutrients inside the cell, but then over time they became vital to the survival of the cell. Because for example, when the Earth's atmosphere became more oxygenated, and oxygen is actually very volatile, very dangerous, we don't know it because we breathe it, but it's very hard to survive in oxygen. A lot of bacteria died off in the oxygen, and still do today. You can kill a lot of bacteria just by putting fresh air into a room. Um, there were two moments early in her career. One of them was that, well, she predicted, if we can ever test the uh, DNA and the nucleus of a human cell, we, she predicted we will find that a lot of the organelles in the cell are not coded for in the DNA. So they're coming from outside, and they're reproducing along with our cells. And in the 1980s, they became able to do this, and lo and behold, she was right. Some of these organelles in the cells are not originally human organelles. They, they were viruses or bacteria that came in that we uh, incorporated, even though they tried to be parasites at first. The other moment was when she asked her professors, have we ever seen evolution in a laboratory? She wanted to see what happens. And they said, there's only one case. 
And it was a case where they took a tank of fruit flies and split it in half, exactly. And on the one half, they slowly turned up the temperature every day. The other half, they slowly turned down the temperature. And after however many months, the two groups of fruit, fruit flies could no longer mate with each other. So they're now essentially different species. So they take the fruit flies, they kill the poor things as they always do and dissect them. And the scientists said, oh my god, we ruined it. There's a virus in the hot fruit flies. The whole thing is tainted. And Margulis said, that's the whole point. Don't you see? The reason the hot fruit flies survive in the hot tank is because of the virus. It's symbiosis at work. They acquired this virus, which enabled them to survive in heat. This is how they became a different species. And I decided to look at, historically, this should be imported into history. Uh, in Latourian actor network theory, relations are always symmetrical. This is why he has very little sympathy for the left, for example. He'll say that there's not something called capitalism oppressing us because if you just juggle, juggle the actors around, the workers can rise up and make themselves the master of the situation. Okay, in principle, yes. In practice, it's extremely difficult. In practice, there usually is an asymmetry. One of the objects is dominant, the other one is not. And this is what the archaeologist Ian Hodder talks about. You had me write a response to these two for LH. Yeah. And this is when I first got into Hodder, so thank you for that. Hodder talks about how um, uh, we are entangled with things that overpower us in ways we can't master. The example he gives is Christmas lights. Um, <laughs> let's say that we decided Christmas lights are a complete waste of energy and they're clogging up the landfills and a lot of them end up in the ocean. And why do we really need these? Can't we have Christmas without the lights? Well, yes, we could do that, but some people won't want to give them up and some people work in factories and their jobs are dependent on these lights, right? This is their livelihood. So the way we become entangled in this path-dependent way with things we don't necessarily need. And Hodder, as an archaeologist, says that at some point in the Neolithic period, humans started to have a lot of stuff. Presumably, this is the point when we first started having fixed dwellings so that we could store all our stuff in our home. Rousseau says this is when families started. Families became property of the husband and father uh, because of a house. So he blames houses for that. And uh, Hodder worries that this makes it very difficult for us, for us to reverse the entanglement. And that's where you don't really have the resources to think of something like that, because relations are always in principle symmetrical and reciprocal. You can, the tables can be turned and the weak can become the strong. This is why he's not very impressed by theories of dominance and hegemony and this sort of thing. But there may be something more to those theories than the Tzor realizes. There, there needs to be some room in the theory for talking about situations where one element of relation is much stronger than the other and it's not really reversible in an easy way. Okay, so that was about symbiosis and, um, well, I was, I remind myself why I was doing that. Um, oh yeah, because I was trying to talk about jumps in history. And in the case of the Dutch East India <coughs> Company, I found that there were about five or six, and I've also hypothesized that there's going to be about five or six symbioses in the history of any object, including <coughs> you, including you. They're going to happen fairly early in your life until you reach mature form, and once you reach mature form, it's very difficult to change your life. It's difficult to change academic disciplines or careers or anything after a certain age. Uh, you can get remarried if you got divorced, but it's, it's a different sort of thing, right? It's, there's, there's certain things you do that are irreversible in the sense that you won't go back to being what you were before if you reverse them. So I could quit my job, but then I'll be a former philosophy professor who quit philosophy. I won't just be the 15 year old who hadn't done philosophy yet. Right? I've already spent all these years in this thing and that's going to have left its mark on me. So um, I've, and also I think Latour's actor network theory overstates the importance of events. I think it's more about objects. It's about a symbiosis between two separate objects. And so we're talking about nouns, not verbs, even though everyone today likes to talk about verbs instead of nouns and processes instead of products. And this has been the intellectual fashion for some decades now. I think it's going too far. And um, so we're, we're looking at nouns. And you know from your old schoolhouse classification that a noun is a person, place, or thing. And so you could start looking for persons, places, and things in the history of the company to see which ones were the truly irreversible moments. And I only found one person. Uh, there's only one person in the history of the Dutch East India Company who was really pivotal, and that was Jan Pietersen Kuhn, who's considered a, an imperialist villain today by most historians, but uh, really is the one who made the Dutch East India Company work. He, he wrote a treatise called Discourse on the State of India, which said to the people in Amsterdam, look, we're at war with Spain and Portugal who want to take away our independence again. We have to survive. The only way we're going to survive is by a complete monopoly on the spice trade between the East Indies and Europe. And not only that, we're gonna to have to monopolize trade between Asian countries. That was the really villainous element. All Asian countries have to trade through us as the middleman from now on. That's the only way we'll survive as a country financially. And um, uh, Amsterdam was very liberal in those days and they didn't like the idea of how much political violence would be needed to enforce this, but they, 
They sort of went along with it half-heartedly. A few years later, they got cold feet. They needed help with it from England in the Thirty Years' War, both on the Protestant side of that war. And so they told Kern to please start giving a third of our profits to the English as part of this greater settlement. And he was furious about this because he'd already defeated the English in the region. He'd, out, he'd outfoxed them and outmaneuvered them. And so he decided he wasn't going to go along with this, and so he arranged a massacre of the English. This is the kind of character he was. And so this completely destroyed the peace treaty between England and Holland. And that was one of the key moments in the development of the company. It ruined the company's reputation ethically for years to come, but it, it helped the company thrive financially. Then I found, I think, three or four geographical choke points. That every time the Dutch conquered one of these, it led to a new era in the history of the company. And then the final one was a transition the company made from long round trips between Indonesia and what is, what's, what's now Indonesia and, and the Netherlands towards focusing more on intra-Asian trade, which eventually became most of their profit. And so they started building different kinds of ships, because these giant ships from Europe couldn't usually fit into Asian rivers, or, which were often shallow. So these, these were the kinds of things that served as symbiotic moments, and they all occurred very early in the history of the company, maybe in the first 40 years. Only once that happened did the company start to rise, because it had reached mature form, it had been able to go up. And then it started going down once nutmeg and mace became less popular, and coffee and tea, which the British had more of, became more popular, and the British started to rise, the Dutch started to fall. Uh, all of this being a way of saying that I don't think actor network theory can account for different periods uh, in the history of uh, life of an object. And Latour hates that book. He likes my other books, but he hates the immaterialism <laughs> book. And I, the reason he gave me is that I'm using too many biological metaphors, which is exactly what he also says about Nicolas Luhmann's sociology. Luhmann uses too many biological metaphors. I counter that it's biographical metaphors. It's not biological metaphors. That I get these concepts from human life, ripeness and decadence and life and death. And I, if you want to read a materialism, I go into more detail about that theory. It's a short book and a, and a quick read. OK. Uh, put my glasses on. Six of five. OK, I'll only give a couple more minutes then. We talked a little about taste in the sciences then. And I thought I'd say something about knowledge in the arts. And as, just as a reminder, knowledge means either what a thing is made of or what it does. Now, no one really seems to be talking about what an artwork is made of. I mean, you could talk about the pigment that it's made of. You could talk about the life of the author that led up to it. But that's less common than people trying to say, I should say there's one exception in your architecture students. The one ex recent exception I can think of is Rem Kohlhaas's uh, Venice Biennale a few years ago, where he was decomposing architecture into its elements. I don't know if any of you saw this show, where there's, you know, there's a doorway section and a uh, what the doorknob section and a roof section and a window section. And I didn't find that to be useless. I found it to be pretty interesting. Um, I'm not sure that's the way for architectural theory to go forward, but it was, I think it was an interesting one-time experience. More often, people, if they want to turn art into a kind of knowledge, try to overmine it and say it's a socio-political effect and what it does, uh, which people it empowers, which people it disempowers. And this generally comes from the left, of course. Now, generally, I think this doesn't work. The reason I don't think it works is because the artwork is always distinct from its, its political effects. If it's any good as an artwork, you should be able to move it into a different time and place, and it will still have a similar effect. Um, there are obviously some exceptions. You know, there's Picasso's Guernica. There's Uncle Tom's Cabin, which is very difficult to separate from its historical impact in the United States. But um, nonetheless, a certain formalism is required in the sense that the thing has to be aestheticized, or else it's not an artwork, it's propaganda. And I think most of us can recognize the difference between artwork and, and something that merely put out a political message that people wanted to hear. So I would suggest that the uh, knowledge aspect of the arts probably is more on the what it's made of side. And this has to do with uh, the link of artworks to their own tradition. Right? That artworks are not understood in a vacuum. They're, they're understood as reactions to a certain tradition in which they appear. And so this is, I think, the place where knowledge comes in. You cannot really appreciate an artwork unless you understand something of the tradition behind it. Um, and this is one of the difficulties about trying to understand something that was made in a completely different culture or tradition. I, I sometimes have trouble understanding great works of analytic philosophy because I'm not part of that tradition and I'm not always familiar with the issues that are important to analytic philosophers and vice versa. Um, analytic philosophers don't always appreciate what Heideggerians appreciate about Heidegger and so forth. Let me just say one last thing about formalism, since I'm going to be talking about that tomorrow in the seminar. Some of you might be there. Um, often the critique of formalism in any of the arts is that it's a kind of elitist way of 
avoiding the disempowered people, the disenfranchised people, and, and talking about an art that belongs only to dead white males and, and this sort of thing. I would say instead that the real problem with formalism is that it's too holistic. And uh, this, uh, you can see this especially in the art criticism of Clement Greenberg, which is just barely coming back into fashion now. You know, he was the dominant art critic of the 1950s and 1960s. You could call him a formalist, even though he didn't like the words, uh, because he didn't think the socio-political context or the biography of the artist was important. That you could understand an artwork on its own terms, much as Kant thought you could. But um, part of the problem with this is that he ends up arguing that an artwork is like a machine and each part is interrelated intimately to every other part. And so even though he frees it from the holism of socio-political and biographical context, it turns into an internal holism in the work itself. That the, all the individual elements of the work are subordinated to the work as a whole. And I've, in the article I wrote for NLH for Rita, I said the same thing about Cleon Brooks' literary criticism, that it, it treats the poem too much as something that's such a sleek machine that every individual part relates to every other individual part. That's one problem with formalism. The other one, which I think comes from Kant, is that Kant doesn't just try to make things autonomous from their surroundings, which I think is necessary. He also tries to make thought and world autonomous from each other. And I'll give you an example. What's Kant's ethics about? Well, a lot of things. But one of the things Kant says in his ethics is that um, ethic, ethical acts have to be good in their own rights. If you're doing something because you want to go to heaven and avoid going to hell, that's not good. That's not ethical. Might be good, but it's not ethical. If you're doing something because you want a better reputation so your business will flourish, that's not ethical. It might be shrewd business tactics, but it's not ethical. So the ethical uh, needs to be self-contained. It needs to be on the side of the mind, not on the side of the world. It's duty because it's, it's done for its own sake. Uh, Max Scheler, who wrote probably the most interesting critique of Kant's ethics. Max Scheler, the German philosopher around World War I, flourishing in that period, talks about how uh, Kant's ethics is great, but it's very, uh, sublimely empty, I think he calls it. Right? Whereas for Shaler, ethics is more about love. It's about passion. It's about being committed to a certain thing. And one of the things that follows from this that we don't get much of a sense of in Kant is that there are ethical vocations. Different people have different ethical vocations. And so you might uh, feel the calling to do something, and that this is your duty because you, no one else can do it but you. Uh, but this does not mean that everyone is called to do it. So if somebody uh, sees a very heart-wrenching film about Syria and what's going on there, they might feel called to go and help the people in Syria. doesn't mean all of us are going to feel that. Some of us might be committing a, a bad act against many people who are depending on us in a different context, that we just drop everything and go to Syria. Um, you, you are needed somewhere else, perhaps. And then you can make the same argument for arts, I've said in my book, Dante's Broken Hammer, that uh, it's not necessarily the case that all good taste should agree on the same arts. Certain people are born to appreciate certain works and to do things with it. And one proof of this you can see is that most major artists in every discipline have had not only major heroes, but minor heroes. Heroes who are not generally heroes to other people. And the case I often think of is T.S. Eliot being very smitten by the poetry of Jules Lafogue, which is not usually considered among the best French poetry of the late 19th century. But Eliot was able to see something in it and transform it and use it for his own purposes. And you're going to find this in the biography of any artist or architect or philosopher. Who's your favorite minor, minor figure? So that will be for tomorrow. And I've already talked long enough. I think I've gone about 12 minutes over. Oh, OK. There's still time for questions for at least 20 minutes. Anybody has any? Yeah, I think you can, uh, you might as well just direct the questions directly to Graham. Thank you so much. Uh, we have, uh, yeah. Uh, 15, 20 minutes, so go ahead. Yes. Uh, I was interested when, when you said that in an aesthetic experience, we are the only object on the scene. Only real object. Yeah. Um, and uh, that reminded me of, of Kant's aesthetics, mm -hmm. in which the beautiful world is not contained in the world of the object of the aesthetic experience, but in in something about the experience itself. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering if you could help me pry those apart a little. Mm -hmm. what, what distinguishes your view? I agree and disagree with Kant. I agree with Kant that um, the artwork is autonomous from its surroundings. I don't agree that it's all on our side, because the qualities of the aesthetic experience are still on the outside. I'm simply providing the support for them. This is why I said that aesthetics is theatrical, because the objects is gone. The object is withdrawn in the same way that Kant's thing in itself is withdrawn. 
And so you would have these qualities just floating there with no supports, except that I regard this as impossible um, for the same reason phenomenology does. The qualities are always subordinate to an object. So what is that object if it's not the object on the art side, which is withdrawn in the case of a metaphor or other aesthetic experience? It has to be us. We are real objects too. This is really me experiencing this room. The room may be an illusion, but this is really me. It's not an image of me experiencing the room, it's the real me. And so the real me is always on the scene in any situation I'm in. And so I have to be called upon to perform that duty and become the substrate of the artwork. And that's why I regard the artwork as theatrical. But the qualities are still coming from outside. Yes? Um, so, this might be a little bit long-winded, but so, imagine you have some thought experiment where this room is entirely locked and only one person can, can go in at a time. And the first person goes in out of two mm -hmm. and looks at the desk and then walks back out and tries to describe it to another person that's right. waiting outside. And he says, well, it's kind of like a box, but with a bastion on the edge and there's a little pork station with this, like, electronic thing on it. And he's constituating, or sorry, con constituting, mm -hmm. I apologize, my language yes. is a little bit off right now. Um, he's constituting this out of metaphors, right, to the other person, and so those are deliberately imprecise, but if he tries to, uh, as you said, to literalize it by giving absolute measurements, um, and a, like a CAD model or whatever, of the desk, it, you lose the object, right? So this person goes in and describes it to his friend, his friend does the same thing after he hears the description, goes in, sees the desk, and goes out. Mm -hmm. The two people, because they can only describe it in metaphors or lose the desk by literalizing it, they, they're not actually perceiving the object in the same way. So each of them are aiming for the object but like falling to one side, mm -hmm. if this experiment, experiment makes sense. Mm -hmm. So the first part of the question is, does that mean that you can't, like two people can never agree on, a, on their perception of the object, and like if they were ever to be able to convey precisely what their perception of the object is, they can't agree on it. And two, what does that mean for say, uh, for science and theory, for example, if you have the theory of gravity, no two people can can precisely perceive gravity or perceive it the same way. How can you actually make decisions on these objects? If you're talking about the properties of a thing, you can agree, I think. And this is why scientific communal work works much better than artistic communal work. Right? If we were to do that same thought experiment, we have two chemists test, testing a wine and then two wine testers testing the same wine and going out and reporting it you're probably going to find that the chemists have the same formula if they work properly on both the wines. The wine tasters are going to have different descriptions. They're probably going to agree about some things. Right? One of them may say it's not really fun wines. That's it's an exaggeration. It's just a velvety panel. I wouldn't have fun. But, but generally, the two scientists are more likely to agree than the two wine tasters. This does not mean that wine tasting is bullshit, which is the conclusion some people would draw. Right? That if it's not replicable with two different tasters, therefore it's nonsense. No, I wouldn't say that at all. I think the same goes for art historians or any other thing like that that's not literal, that's not involving literal descriptions of an object, you're going to have variance. Well, my question, my question wasn't meant to imply that like wine tasting is bullshit because it's aesthetic. The question yeah. is, uh, how does the interaction uh, take place? Like, how do people... So you can have an empirical agreement about what the properties of the wine are, but you're not going to, like, for example, be able to convey to somebody what the impact of the wine will be on a particular community mm -hmm. or on a particular person based on its chemical formula. So what is the actual process by which multiple people can act and make decisions about the same object in concert when none of them are actually thinking about the same object? They have a different image of it. They might have a different image about it, of it, but they're still referring to the same thing, even if the qualities they think are different. So it's still possible to talk about the same thing. Um, it's just that the, the way it's talked about is going to be much more different in the case of the, the non-literal people, namely the wine tasters, than it will be in the case of the scientists. There's always more guaranteed agreement if you're just simply measuring the qualities of the thing and reporting them, than if you're trying to, how can I put this? I wrote a book on H.P. Lovecraft, the horror writer, five years ago. And um, what's always interested me is that some, some people, look, some critics of Lovecraft will say Lovecraft is not scary because a dragon with an octopus head is not scary. Okay, a dragon with an octopus head is not scary. Yeah, if you saw it, it probably would be, but it's... <laughs> I agree, the literary just saying, I saw a monster and it was a dragon with an octopus head. That sounds kind of juvenile. <laughs> but that's not how he does it. If you go and look at the passage, it's, it's brilliant. He says something like, in my disordered fancy, I imagine that it might not be entirely inaccurate to say that it was somewhat like a dragon with the pulpy tentacled head but he said, but and then that's already good. But then he says something like, but there was something more. It was the general outline of the whole that made it most frightful. Now, 
that's going beyond the description of the qualities. And I think the people who don't think a dragon with an octopus head is scary are sticking on the level of literal qualities. What's scary about Lovecraft is he drives that same wedge between the objects and its qualities by being by perpetually talking about his own inability to describe it. Now, of course, you get bad pulp writing if you say the thing was so horrible it was I can't describe it. <laughs> but Lovecraft subverts that cliche too. He says in um, in the Dunwich War, when that giant monster Wilbur Watley is killed in the library at Miskatonic University, and the dog his dog kills it, I think. He says he started to describe this this inhuman torso below the waist that Wilbur has, and he says. It would be trite and not wholly accurate to say that no human pen could describe it. So see, he's already undercutting that cliche. And then he goes on to say, and yet it may fairly be said that it could not properly, properly be visualized by anyone whose ideas of aspect and contour are too closely tied to the known three dimensions. <laughs> now that's scary writing. <laughs> that's scary writing because it's so elusive. It's so You're getting a sense of the breakdown of language step by step in Lovecraft's case. And that's why he's such a triple O. Uh, writer, because he's, he's talking about that same theme that we talk about. That's one kind of, of tension that you find in Lovecraft, the most famous one. But there's another one that I found, which I call the cubist tension, right? Because in the, in, from the of cubism, the object isn't really withdrawn or hidden. It's there. It's just broken up into all these profiles, right? And so what's, what Lovecraft does to mirror this is, in, in At the Mountains of Madness, he's talking about that Antarctic city that he sees reflected in the ice clouds. And he says, um, you know, there's no problem describing this. And then he just goes on to describe it. It's this impossible description of 20 things. It's like, I wish I had it and I could read it to you. It's something like, there were beetling, multitudinous, rectangular slabs grouped in curious clusters of five. And I'd have to read the whole thing to you if you need to start laughing. You know, because there's no way you could possibly integrate all these things together in your image of one city. And this is why paintings of Lovecraft are often so horrible. <laughs> because they try to paint literally what's being described, and you just get this weird-looking, vulgar science fiction imagery. And I don't think there's ever going to be a good Lovecraft movie for the same reason, because nothing can, visually can possibly live up to what he's doing in language. And I think Poe is like that sometimes, too. Now that we're at University of Virginia, Poe was almost on the matter. Um, <laughs> he probably pioneered that, and, and Lovecraft just takes it and pushes it really far. Poe po also gives a lot of descriptions that are not filmable. They're just too weird. Oh, yes. I'm oh, sorry. Next to you. Um, so I have a question. I'm glad you ended on aesthetics, mm -hmm. uh, or uh, ethics, rather, um, uh, at the end of the lecture, because you know, our, I, I dealt a lot with triple O, uh, mm -hmm. especially in architectural education. And you know, there's always this kind of question, uh, especially within architecture, when we prescribe to a philosophy please philosopher tell us what to do. And you've been very upfront in saying, no, I'm not yeah. going to do that. That's on you because you're the practitioner. That being said, how do you kind of view the discipline of triple O um, and by extension philosophy in general? Do you see it as something that provides a framework for kind of metaphorical analysis? Or do you think that there's an ethical dimension where it does directly tie in to say practice? Are you talking about architectural practice? Um, any type of you know, artwork or anything. I think it's, again, it's hard to translate problems directly from one discipline to another because the concerns are so different. I think a discipline can be an irritant for another discipline. Mm -hmm. That's Lumont's term. Um, I think architecture has a history of taking philosophers too literally. So you had a lot of folds in buildings when Deleuze's The Fold came out. And uh, deconstructivist architecture was probably too literal an interpretation of Derrida, which I think is not always bad. I mean, because there's always going to be some mistranslation, maybe, or even proper translation. My understanding of how Triple O worked its way into architecture is that it seems like architecture is sort of at the end of a very long Deleuzean period where Deleuze's concepts float in. And um, even if you read Patrick Schumacher's Autopoiesis of Architecture book, that giant one, he's not really a Deleuzean, literally, but there's a lot of Deleuzean ideas in there when he's saying parametric architecture is about you can never have, cor you know, you can never have corners on buildings. Um, everything's supposed to be smooth and gradual, and the building's supposed to blend naturally into its surroundings, to the point where he says the whole city has to be built in the same style. So he says the city should legislate that only his style should be allowed, which has another political dimension to it. And what I like about Patrick is that he's always honest about his own failings. And he says, I have to admit there's one problem with this theory. I have no idea where to put the doors and windows. It's completely arbitrary, because right? everything's supposed to be smooth. And, and um, 
As my friend David Ruiz Syark pointed out, it's not just doors and windows. Architecture is all about articulating spaces. And, um, to just give that up in the name of this Deleuzian ideology, or in his case, Lumanian ideology, where everything's related to everything else. But, uh, Patrick says architecture is about framing social communications, and I've objected that it's also about framing non-communications, isn't it? You're creating spaces which do not entirely communicate with the outside world. That's the whole point. You need a space of retreat sometimes. A building is different from its surroundings ipso facto, right? You, you're not just blending in everything else. You're creating something specific that has an interior. And you might try to downplay that interior by putting lots of windows and things, but but it's still, you're, you're framing a non-communication, I would say, too. And Triple O has a lot to say about non-communication in an intellectual era where everything's about communication, relation, and context, your favorite term. <laughs> um, and I think this is why it's been picked up. Now, how it's going to develop in architecture or any other field, I leave to the people in those fields. Especially in art, I, I can't design a thing. You know, I can't even draw very well. I was always the worst kid in art class when I was in school, when I was young. So it's gonna be up to the architects. And, and uh, I've seen several different approaches to it. I've seen some people try to take a kind of minimalist reading to triple O in architecture. I've seen, um, you know, Tom Wiscombe, another of my colleagues, has done this sort of object in a sack sort of thing, where it's not entirely clear what's there beneath the envelope, but it's, it's sort of projecting itself outside. Then there's Mark Foster Gage at Yale, who takes the more gothic approach, where you're just grafting things onto other things one after another. and some of you have probably seen that wild skyscraper plan he has for West Manhattan, which I think is hilarious. I don't know if it'll ever get built. So there's, it's too early to say, and I would never legislate to anybody, just like I would never legislate to artists what a triple O artwork would be like. I, I can give them some negative hints, maybe, that, that, you know, maybe saying minimalism is not triple O, because it is too literal, and triple O is emphatically not about literalism. But um, I can't tell anybody in any of these fields what to do. And the same thing, you can't translate art and architecture directly into philosophy. You can be inspired by it or irritated by it in a positive sense. But you can't want give one-to-one -one correspondences. Um, and this might have something to do with the fact that you know, Aristotle says a substance is something that can have different qualities at different times. And I think, to make a small pun here, the more substantial a theory is, the more different and opposite things it can do. I've often noticed, for example, that the best philosophers usually have political backers on all sides. So you have left and right Hegelians, because Hegel's great. You have left and right Heideggerians, left and right Nietzscheans. You don't get left and right Baudouians yet, and I'm worried about him. <laughs> Until I see some right-wing Baudouians, there's always the risk that he's a Maoist propagandist in some way, right? He, he's, he's an important philosopher, but there's always the risk that if people on the right don't see some intellectual utility in this, and it's only his fellow Maoists and other fellow radicals on the left, this might indicate that they like him for insufficiently deep reasons. They like him because he supports what they believe. They like his conclusions. Whereas, you know, you've got Marcuse who likes Heidegger, but you've also got a lot of right-wing radicals who like Heidegger. So this shows that there's a certain depth to the theory. And I would say the same thing in different disciplines. If there are more different uses that can be made of a philosophy in a certain discipline, it's probably a good sign that it's alive in some way. So do you think the commonality is that, you know, the dirty word, the dirty deed word, discipline, nowadays, the reason why Triple O has become so interdisciplinary is because there's a common enemy in, say, Kantian thought? Except that it's, Kant's not just an enemy, because I do agree with the thing in itself part of Kant. I just don't agree with the idea that the human world relation is central to all the relations. Mm -hmm. I think the reason, I think there are two reasons Triple O has caught on a lot of disciplines more than the other speculative realist philosophies, which are all very interesting. One of them is that uh, every discipline has this issue of objects and relations, objects and their context. How do you negotiate the relation between those? Pretty much any discipline in the humanities, social sciences, maybe even the natural sciences has this issue. The other one is I think we write interesting stuff. It's, it's fun to read triple O authors, I, I hope and I think, in ways that it's not always fun to read the nihilist wing of speculative realism, for example, which is very turgid and uses too much terminology. Um, and I think there's a problem with Mayasu, which I think, here's the problem with Mayasu, I think, who I really admire as a very philosophically talented person. He structures his philosophy too much as a proof it's a series of steps, and you have to agree with every step, and then you reach this wonderfully wild conclusion that everything's contingent and God doesn't exist but might exist in the future. But the problem with it is that if you're, if you're presenting your philosophy as a proof, then if the proof doesn't work, everything comes crumbling down. It's a house of cards. I agree with Whitehead that the proof is a fairly subordinate method in philosophy, that philosophy is not geometry. Philosophy, as Whitehead puts it, is descriptive generalization. And so being wrong about one of your 
first assumptions does not mean the whole philosophy collapses. Who, who really thinks Spinoza has good proofs for his philosophy? None of them will be accepted today. But we still remember this model he has. The universe is God, and God has all these different aspects, but we can only see the thought and the extension. This is why we remember Spinoza, because it's such a fascinating way of looking at the world, not because we found his proofs overwhelmingly convincing. It's not Euclid. Right? It's not that you have to go through each step, and then you reach a conclusion that no one can doubt. When has this ever happened in philosophy? This idea of philosophy as a knowledge, when has this ever happened? That certain philosophical things have been proven, and they're unshakable? Let me go back to Kuhn again for a second, because Kuhn says uh, sciences have a pre-paradigmatic stage before the paradigm is set, when they're new. And what characterizes this pre-paradigmatic stage the most, Kuhn says, is that everybody has to start from scratch every time. Everybody has to go back and redo the first principles, because there's no agreed upon first principles. But this is what philosophy does. Every philosopher tears everything down and starts from scratch. This is the best proof that we're a pre-paradigmatic discipline. We're constantly starting over and over again. We're not making progress. Philosophy does not make progress in the way that physics does. And it's even questionable whether physics makes progress in the easy sense. But certainly philosophy does not. It, uh, and I think a lot of times analytic philosophers make the mistake of thinking this is how philosophy works. That it's a series of arguments which are either true or false. And Plato makes six mistaken arguments. And this is why you know, we have to improve. No, that's not why Plato is interesting. Plato is not interesting because he's right about stuff. He's interesting because he was the origin of something, and he set out certain basic possibilities that we continue to go back to and discover over and over again. And the fact that there's no progress, I think, is a, a uh, virtue of philosophy, not a vice. That it's al always being torn down and started over again. And this is the mistake I think Masu and his teacher Bad are making. That they think philosophy is giving us a kind of knowledge, which means a kind of progressive accumulation of knowledge, which it's not. Nor is art. I think art starts over and over again every time. Architecture, too, although in architecture there is some progress on the side of engineering, and, and but this is somewhat extrinsic, I think, to what the discipline really is. Uh, oh, you were next. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that kind of ties in with what you're saying. Um, do you think that our collective cultural aesthetic taste goes through paradigm shifts? Sure. And do you think it's related to science? There might be some relation to science. Certainly the cultures go through collective paradigm shifts. I mean, there was Art Deco all over the place at one point, and now, what is it, just kind of... Bland modernism probably is the default style, isn't it? Um, yeah, and literature too, right? Is the kind of the kind of default literary innovation is some kind of modernist thing? Yeah. So um, sure, sure, it does go through paradigm shifts, and I'm not sure how closely those are tied to science. I think science can sometimes have an impact on that just as the arts can sometimes have an impact on science. And of course, Einstein was uh, decisively influenced by a number of philosophers, such as Mach, Leibniz, and Kant. I think the, you know, now we have this suspicion of scientists saying that philosophy is worthless, it's a waste of time. You get from Stephen Hawking. That probably comes from post-war Anglophone dominance of the sciences. There's always this slight anti-intellectual streak in the English-speaking countries when it comes to scientists reading humanities and reading philosophy, and Feynman was like this too, right? He didn't really have any interest in philosophical speculation. And um, many, many scientists have the idea that even trying to interpret quantum theory is a mistake. Just shut up and calculate is how it's sometimes described. Shut up and calculate. If we can make lasers out of it, that's enough. <laughs> um, so I don't know if, if that's enough of an answer. I'm more in architecture really okay. than in art, just because there's so many um, changes in how things can be built. Mm -hmm. But sure, anytime a new technique is available in architecture, I'm sure that changes the aesthetic. I mean, once you could have an all-glass outer wall and the structural work was done with the steel on the interior, obviously new aesthetic possibilities are open, right? And I don't know what it is these days, uh, what the new physical techniques are that make the. I don't know, maybe it's. I hear about transparent buildings and things like this, or invisible buildings. Are they still thinking of building an invisible building next to the Seoul airport? Or was that just a popular journalist thing I read? <laughs> yeah, they were going to put an invisible skyscraper next to the Seoul airport, which sounded crazy. But... Perhaps at uh, this point, um, <laughs> I think Graham's really given us his all an amazingly energetic and engrossing lecture. So please give him thank you.